All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for joining us. Good afternoon. Um, we're going to get started with our update call shortly, um, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Yola Shubielski, and I'm the Director of Public Information here at the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. And just a quick note that at the end of our, our briefing here and our update, we are going to take questions, so Chris will be available for that. And how we're going to do that is we're going to just be letting folks unmute themselves at the end, and we can take questions that way. Or you can go ahead and chat us a question. I'll be watching the chat box and we'll be able to read that back to Chris. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Chris Logue, our Department of Agriculture Markets Division of Plant Industry Director for the update. Chris? Yes, thank you so much. You'll appreciate the uh, introduction. So I'm Chris Logue. I'm the director here at New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets for the Division of Plant Industry. And first off, I want to thank all of you for joining the call today and for your continued interest about uh, spotted lanternfly and the important work that we do here at the department and uh, in the division of plant industry. So again, thank you so much for joining. Um, all of you with the media, as well as all of our, our partners uh, have been so critical in helping us to get the word out about spotted lanternfly and share the various messages with the public, uh, whether it be asking them to help us uh, uh, through uh, reporting of spotted lanternfly or scraping egg masses or or with, um, you know, stepping on or stomping on adults uh, that they see along the way here. Um, before I talk about specifically where we are uh, today with spotted lanternfly, I just want to give a little bit of brief background uh, for everybody's context. Um, so what is spotted lanternfly? And, and we've covered this a number of times, but again, important to have a little bit of background and context for folks. Uh, spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper uh, that is native uh, to Asia. Uh, it was first discovered in the United States and Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, and as with many invasive species, we don't necessarily know for sure uh, how it got here. We think that perhaps it, it got here as some uh, egg masses on some shipments of stone for construction, but we don't know that for sure. And, and that's often the case with invasive species that we don't know exactly how it got here. Um, since 2014, spotted lanternfly has been found uh, not only in some of our neighboring states, but also as far south as Virginia and more recently, uh, North Carolina, as well as as far west as Indiana and, uh, and Michigan. It can be a destructive uh, insect. It will feed on uh, well more than 70 uh, plant species, including things like Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, which is actually an introduced and invasive species in and of itself. But more importantly, um, and in particular interest here in New York State is, is it can uh, have an economic impact uh, through its feeding on, on, uh, on grapevines. And New York is number three in, uh, in grape production here in the United States. So from our perspective at the Department of Agriculture and Markets, uh, grapes are certainly our biggest concern as we uh, talk about spotted lanternfly. Um, also, you know, a little bit about how they move around and what we know about them from that perspective. Um, they tend to be very good hitchhikers and they can move around in really all of their life stages, which is a challenge. Um, but in particular, the eggs can be moved very long distances. And uh, from a life cycle perspective, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, further into the, into the discussion, um, you know, the eggs are laid in the fall of the year and they go through the winter. And so material that's moved through the winter months or material that is moved in the early spring before emergence um, can be the biggest ways of having uh, long distance uh, transport. So, as I said, we're really concerned about spotted lanternfly uh, because of the potential impact on crops. And uh, as I said, our biggest concern right now is, is what it can potentially do uh, to our, to our uh, grape production. Um, but also, you know, keep in mind that this is something that's only been in the country for 
about eight years now, and there's a, still a lot that we don't know about spotted lanternfly, and we don't want to be caught by surprise in the future if it begins to cause issues on on other other crops uh, or natural resources that are important to us. Uh, the biggest takeaway on on spotted lanternfly uh, damage is that um, it basically sucks the sap out of the plant. And it can make them, uh, it can stress plants out, can make them more susceptible to drought stress, it can make them more susceptible to other uh, attacks from other insects and diseases. Um, but also, the spotted lanternfly excretes uh, a material called honeydew, uh, which is just a sugary substance which gets deposited on plants as well as other materials that are, that are in proximity to them when they're feeding. And then we also can get uh, a material called sooty mold that will grow on that honeydew. And that can reduce photosynthesis in plants. The honeydew also perhaps can uh, cause an off flavor in grapes and perhaps in other, uh, other crops that we might uh, be growing. A little bit on economic impact here. And again, this, uh, this is for in general invasive insects in the United States. Um, Impact is huge, really up to 70 billion per year. And for spotted lanternfly um, in New York, it could have a very uh, large impact on the New York State uh, grape and wine industry, uh, which is valued, I believe, at about $300 million annually. Another concern that we hear a lot from the urban parts of the state, as well as uh, when we talk with our counterparts in other states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, what have you, that also have spotted lanternfly. Uh, we also get a lot of uh, um, feedback from the general public about the fact that the presence of spotted lanternfly makes it unpleasant to be outdoors and to partake in outdoor recreation activities. And we certainly are very cognizant of that and very concerned about, about that, as well as the agricultural impacts. So now a little bit about uh, where we are, t uh, where we are today uh, with spotted lanternfly in New in New York. Um, first off, I want to thank all of our partner agencies, in particular uh, USDA, who has been here uh, with us from the start on spotted lanternfly, as well as several other invasive species programs. Uh, they're a, a very strong partner. Uh, we work very well together with them, and also I want to thank. Uh, our neighboring states, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut, who we also uh, work cooperatively, cooperatively with on a regular basis. And also, I really want to point out that this is not strictly an ag and markets uh, uh, program. We are the lead on spotted lanternfly, but we also have uh, really great cooperation from all of the partner agencies on the New York State uh, Invasive Species Council, in particular New York State DOT, uh, Thruway, uh, DEC, uh, and Parks. So where we are today, uh, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of background here for you as well. Um, our first discovery of uh, spotted lanternfly in New York was in August of 2020 on Staten Island, and it was our partners over at uh, New York State Parks who actually discovered that in one of their um, one of their locations on Staten Island and reported that. And from there, we did extensive survey through the uh, through the fall of 2020 on Staten Island and confirmed it uh, uh, there in uh, a number of locations. And since then, uh, since August of 2020, uh, we've also confirmed it in the other boroughs of New York City as well as 15 additional counties in New York State. Um, one of the things that I do want to say is that just because a county is, is uh, highlighted as, as having spotted lanternfly, it does not necessarily mean that it's the whole county. Uh, in some cases, uh, the density is, is relatively high as far as the population is concerned. Um, and in particular, we're seeing that in New York City, as well as some of the locations in the in the Hudson Valley. But in other parts of the state, um, for instance, Ithaca, um, 
Syracuse, Buffalo, uh, also here in the capital the capital region uh, in uh, Ravina. The numbers the numbers are smaller, and the areas that uh, have spotted lanternfly are a little bit more more discreet. So that's an important thing to keep in in mind. Also, you know, I do want to point out here also that uh, that the public and their ability to recognize spotted lanternfly um, and their willingness to report it to us has really been uh, crucial in our ability to keep track of where this is. Um, that's important as we put together our plans as far as management of spotted lanternfly. But it's also very important when we look at some of our one of our other missions here in plant industry, which is uh, making sure that uh, agricultural goods that are shipped out of New York State have easy access to other markets and having a good sense of where spotted lanternfly or other pests of concern are located in the state helps us with that mission, uh, which is really very, very important. Just a little bit about a uh, life cycle about spotted lanternfly, and, and this is really, frankly, one of the main reasons that, that we uh, put this uh, meeting together today uh, was just to uh, have everybody be on the lookout for spotted lanternfly. Um, as I mentioned before, the eggs are laid in the fall and they winter over through the uh, winter months and then they emerge in the spring of the year. And typically what we found the last several years uh, here in the Northeast is that typically we're seeing emergence sometime during the month of May. However, this year it's been a little bit earlier and we did get reports of emergence in a couple of locations in New York City here um, last week. And we were able to go out to uh, those locations and actually confirm that the early instar uh, juvenile uh, spotted lanternfly had emerged in those areas. Um, we may find that we have a little bit of an early hatch in other parts of the state as well. I will say, obviously, New York City is a little bit is a little bit warmer. Uh, you also have sort of the urban heat sink effect, uh, which again uh, probably influenced that earlier earlier emergence as well. We also have got a couple different models out there that we use for trying to predict uh, when spotted lanternfly is, is going to emerge. And so, depending upon where you are in the state, uh, that could be anywhere uh, over the next couple of weeks into mid to late May. And again, very much dependent upon what the weather does, but also I always point out to people that New York State is a very large state. Uh, with a very diverse, uh, diverse landscape and a lot of microclimates. And so it's very hard to predict emergence um, uh, in any one particular area uh, at any given time. So keep that in mind as well. But we may see this trend of early emergence as well in the Hudson Valley, as well as Long Island. So we wanted to be sure that people were aware that they may start to see these things a little bit earlier. The other thing that's really important is, is the early instar uh, is, is very, very small and a lot of people will overlook it and not notice it. Um, but again, if you go onto our website, we do have some good uh, outreach materials as do our friends at, at Cornell Cooperative Extension and the New York State IPM program. So you can get a good visual of what it is that, that uh, we're looking for. So a little bit about what folks can do about uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, again, so through the winter months, we had encouraged folks to go out and uh, do what's called egg mass scraping. And in fact, our staff, as well as staff from other agencies, including USDA, did quite a bit of egg mass scraping uh, through the winter months. By doing that, uh, you're uh, influencing or reducing the population and the number of, of uh, nymphs that will emerge in the spring. At this point, we're probably just about past uh, egg scraping. And again, very much dependent upon the climate in your particular area. But we are asking, as I said before, for residents to be on the lookout for the first instar. Um, it is a fairly uh, small insect with black body with white spots. 
uh, does not have the uh, the very uh, showy wings of the adult uh, spotted lanternfly. And if you do see spotted lanternfly, uh, you know, uh, nymphs here early on, and in particular, if you're out on the east end of Long Island or uh, in some of the areas upstate where we haven't confirmed the presence of spotted lanternfly, by all means, please, please report that uh, via our uh, online reporting tool. You can put GPS coordinates in there. You can put a picture in there. Um, and uh, we'd rather we'd rather have reports. Uh, and in fact, even if it's even if you're not sure of what it is, uh, report it and put a picture on there. And we can certainly look uh, look at those and um, you know add that data into our system. A little bit of information just for our ag businesses and really for all of our businesses. So in particular, our vineyards, especially on Long Island and, and in the Hudson Valley, they need to be looking very carefully and should be starting to monitor for spotted lanternfly. Um, really any of the grape producing areas should be looking for it, but in particular, those two areas of Long Island and in the, in the Hudson Valley, uh, where we do have confirmed uh, confirm confirmations of spotted lanternfly. Those are going to be really important, um, as well as the other parts of of the state where grapes are very very important. Also, uh, I wanted to mention that we do have our survey and treatment crews uh, out and about, and they'll continue to be out all through the year. We surveyed uh, all through uh, the fall and the winter months, trying to delimit. Uh, areas where spotted lanternfly had been uh, reported. And again, you know, these folks have a really hard demanding job being out in the environment in all types of weather conditions and all types of uh, landscapes. So, you know, try to be supportive of those folks and uh, also be helpful uh, and courteous to them if they're asking for access to property for survey. Um, if you have questions about survey crews and you want to be sure that that folks, um, you know, are actually working uh, for us, you can ask for IDs. They all have IDs as well as, uh, you know, uh, uniforms so that you can uh, recognize folks. So a couple things as far as what we're doing about spotted lanternfly this year, it is a continuation of of our actions over the last couple of years. We continue to work very, very closely with all, all of our partner agencies that I mentioned before, DO, DEC, Parks, uh, DOT, Thruway, as well as USDA. USDA uh, has a real focus on, the, uh, on our ports. And so those are the places where agricultural products are being, um, are being shipped out of. Also our, our partners at Customs and Border Protection uh, are stationed in those in those ports of entry as well as those places where exports are taking place, and we want to try to keep spotted lanternfly away from those locations um, because they are high risk for for spreading uh, spotted lanternfly to other to other places. Also, uh, we continue to uh, conduct surveys in high risk high risk areas across the state. Um, and just for definition's sake, high risk areas, really what we're seeing is that spotted lanternfly tends to follow our, our transportation routes and, uh, you know, is moving in commerce as well as, uh, you know, through recreational and, and other types of travel. We continue to uh, inspect and certify nursery stock for, uh, for shipments going out as well as uh, shipments coming in from other places where we know we have spotted lanternfly. Uh, we look at stone shipments as well as other uh, commercial shipments, and uh, in particular, work with our uh, partner states um, who also have spotted lanternfly in their states to be sure that we have best management practices in place uh, to minimize the spread of spotted spotted lanternfly. Also, uh, working with various businesses uh, to try to minimize the risk of accidental movement. And really, that leads us into uh, outreach and education. And really, a lot of this is making people aware of the, of the risk and aware of the relatively easy things that they can do to be sure that spotted lanternfly doesn't move. So, at this time of year, in particular, in 
places further upstate in the cooler areas where it hasn't emerged, if you are traveling or if you are uh, going to uh, a camp or you're moving and you have uh, material that was stored outside that maybe has egg masses laid on them, you should be inspecting that stuff. And if you find egg masses, scrape those off before you transport that material. Later on in the year, you should be looking at, you know, looking at vehicles and being sure that spotted lanternfly aren't in the wheel wells or what have you and and uh, hitchhiking and and uh, traveling that way. Also, we continue with a lot of different mechanical control measures. I've talked a little bit about egg scraping, but we also have been using vacuums uh, out in the environment to vacuum up uh, the uh, juvenile spotted lanternfly as well as the adults. And we actually do see a little bit of a difference uh, in population and a reduction in population in those areas where we've used those mechanical means. So finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the national effort uh, for slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. Um, we've been part of a group uh, that was put together by USDA APHIS, the National Plant Board, which is which is basically all of the uh, plant industry, uh, plant regulatory officials uh, in each of the states, as well as the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture to put together a five-year strategic plan on spotted lanternfly. Uh, we've had uh, a diverse group of states involved in this. We've had California, Washington, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Illinois, as well as New York involved in that uh, effort. That uh, strategic plan is going to be released shortly, um, and certainly we can make you aware when that does come out. Um, and really important just to, to note, you know, the, the uh, participation from California and Washington they don't have spotted lanternfly yet in the western states, as I mentioned before. The further furthest west that it is 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 Illinois and Michigan, but they certainly don't want it in California. And again, California is is number one in grape production, and their uh, industry is very very concerned about uh, the potential presence of spotted lanternfly. So finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, research. So one of the things that was highlighted in the in the strategic plan that's going to be coming out is, you know, the importance of of the research community and looking at what's going on with spotted lanternfly and providing us with with long term solutions. Um, it's a really active research community. I had an opportunity to meet with some of those folks uh, last week up in. Uh, uh, Geneva, New York, at the uh, New York State uh, Agritech Agricultural Experiment Station. We had folks from a number of states, as well as from uh, USDA around the table, trying to talk about or talking about um, what the research priorities are uh, as we as we try to continue to work with with spotted lanternfly. So with that, I will stop there, Yola, and. Um, if you want to do the questions, that's great. Got it. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, just for everyone's awareness, I did share the link to our website and our resources on Spotted Lanternfly in the chat box, so you'll have that there. Um, and we're also recording this. I didn't mention that at the top, but we are recording it, so if anybody needs it after this call is over, you can certainly reach out to us or check our YouTube page. It should be posted there shortly after this call ends. Um, so, as Chris mentioned, we're going to take it over to members of the media now for any questions. Um, we do have a much larger group than we actually anticipated right off the bat. So, we're going to give it a shot. If you're a member of the media, media and have a question right now, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, or you can chat the question and I'll read it out to Chris as well. So, if there's any questions, now would be the time. Hi, Alex Crichton at uh, WXXI in Rochester. Uh, just wondering, what's the situation in the Finger Lakes region? Uh, any spots, uh, spottings here? So, yeah, thanks for the question. So, we we do have a site in Ithaca, actually, that um, we had uh, we had had a report of spotted lanternfly, actually, from a from a Cornell student. 
Um, and we were able to delimit that location. And this is, this is a relatively old report and forgive me, I'm not going to come up with the uh, exact year on it. I think it was 2020 or 2021 on that one. Um, that was some, uh, was some vacant property actually when we delimited that. And we actually were able to go in there and uh, remove remove some uh, some scrubby trees and chip them that had egg masses on them. Uh, we've been in there, uh, you know, repeatedly scouting that area. We've found a couple of adults along the way. We've actually had contractors go in and, and treat that particular area as well because of the proximity to uh, the wine growing region, as well as the proximity to, um, you know, to Cornell and, and Ithaca College. And we know that there's a, a lot of traffic in and out of there. Um, early on, probably 2016 or 17, I want to say, we did have a report in Penyan as well. And we surveyed that area very, very heavily. And we've continued, continued to go back there and, and have never found anything in that particular location. But it's probably just a matter of time before it gets here, right? Well, it is a very good hitchhiker. And I do think that we can anticipate we will find it in additional areas. I think that's a very realistic view. And it's also why, you know, the my final point in, in my discussion was, was about uh, research and finding long-term uh, management measures for, for this. I'm speaking to you. Oh, I have a question. Um, Anne-Marie Barron from the Staten Island Advance. Um, the vacuum method that you mentioned, have you been using that method in New York City, specifically Staten Island, and, and will you be continuing to use that method going forward? So, uh, I don't know specifically if we have used that in Staten Island at this point. I can get back with you on that. Okay. And also, would you recommend that residents use any kind of vacuum method to, to handle the situation on their properties? So that's a great question. So yes, we do know that we do know that uh, you know vacuuming them up is. Is certainly a good practice. What we do when we vacuum them up, we then empty them into a into a plastic bag and and basically put them in the sun, and that will will kill them. Um, yeah. And certainly, uh, certainly that is something that you uh, that homeowners can do. Um, and we know that we've had some folks. Uh, I believe we had a video that was shared with us from a community garden somewhere in New York City where they were using. Were, they were using that methodology. So a shop vac, probably anything they would use outside, I guess would work. Yeah, right? a shop vac, a shop vac, or a cordless shop vac. What we what we have used is a was it is a backpack, uh, uh -huh. cordless um, cordless vacuum uh, that runs on a battery. That is uh, because often we're in places where we can't plug in, obviously. So that has worked really, uh -huh. really well for us. And I will just say that that was a solution that came forward from uh, one of our survey staff who who brought that forward and, and it actually has worked pretty well. And we know that there are several other states that are also using that. And we also know that there are some uh, pest control companies who are who are using that method as well. And, and you say you don't need to put any kind of, you don't have to put them in a liquid or anything. If you just put them in the plastic bag and leave them in the sun, they'll die. Seal them up in a plastic bag and put them in the sun and that will, that will take care of them. They are, uh, they need to be feeding. And so within uh, a few hours, they will be, uh, they'll be done for in there. Can you Thank tell you. us? Can, yeah, Dave McKinley from Channel 2 News in Buffalo. We're in the far western part of the state, of course. Can you tell us if there are, you found them here or not? Uh, that's the first part of the question, if I could. Sure. So yes, so there is a location in Buffalo that we uh, lo that we found uh, through a, a homeowner report, actually uh, last end of last season. We have been in that location, um, you know, over the 
since it was reported and we've surveyed that. So we have a good sense of, of the size of that particular area. All right. And secondly, um, what kind of sprayable pesticides can we use? If we don't have the vacuum handy and we want to um, use a, a, you know, a commercial or, a, you know, an available pesticide, what's best? Yeah, so we're, we don't make pesticide recommendations here at, uh, at Ag and Markets. So what, what I'd refer you to is to go to the local Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, and they can make a pesticide recommendation for you. There's been a lot of research into that and there is a list available. Anyone have any other questions? And again, you can also chat us. Um, I see that uh, my colleague Hannah also put in some additional resources in the chat box. Um, oh, right, from Sarah. She's asking uh, from the Post Journal. So, Chris, just so you read this out in Syracuse, any locations that have been found closer to the Jamestown area in Western New York? Um, excuse me, not Post, post Journal out in Western New York. I apologize. I was reading that as Post Standard. Uh, I do not believe so. And one more question, again, from Staten Island. How did the population in Staten Island compare to the populations you're finding in other areas of the state and, and other areas in New York City? Oh, good question. So I think the, you know, the numbers in, in Staten Island are probably a little bit higher, as well as, you know, in New York City, I think the numbers, the numbers are higher. And, and that mm -hmm. simply is a function of, that's a function of time, frankly. And so, um, you know, as time goes on, population is is going to uh, is going to get is going to get larger. And so, um, you know, that was our first location. Um, you know, and also I will say, you know, in proximity to infested areas of of New Jersey as well. Yeah. So it's going to grow, obviously, across the state, the population. We should be con particularly concerned because we already have such a high population, right? You should be concerned. I think, you know, I think the the place that I will say is is promising is on the research side of things. There are a lot of a lot of universities and a lot of, uh, you know, scientists at USDA who are looking at this and trying to understand exactly what's going on with spotted lanternfly, understand the life cycle better. And from that, uh, you know, potentially come, uh, you know, measures, measures that will reduce the population uh, going into the future. But again, that's a, that's, that's not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. Chris, I have a couple of questions that came in um, over the chat box. So the first question is, have any spotted lanternfly been found in the Syracuse area? If so, has there been any growth in the population in the last few years? And that one is from the standard. Thank you. <laughs> yep. So there is a location in Syracuse that, again, uh, that was a location that we, we uh, detected um, last summer, uh, late in the summer, if I remember correctly. Uh, we've delimited that one. You know, it appears to be uh, relatively, relatively small at this point in time. And then we also have a question from, uh, it looks like WRFA, it says, do you anticipate adding public campaigns like in Pennsylvania that include posters encouraging people to kill, stop, spot at lanternfly? Yeah, we actually have had a great partnership with Pennsylvania and they have shared a lot of that material with us. We've had that message out there and we'll continue to have that message out there. Um, I have a question, are you working with local politicians in any way for them to spread the news or education, schools, anything like that? 
So, yeah, we have some really good partnerships, as I've mentioned a couple of times through the call. So when when we when we have a detection in a new county, um, we are working with uh, the New York State IPM program, as well as the Cornell Cooperative Extension in the county to make them aware that we found spotted lanternfly in the county. We make all of the outreach and education materials to folks available to folks at that time. And in fact, those are available to, you know, to, to, uh, to anybody at this point, whether you have spotted lantern fly in the, in the county or municipality or not. Um, and, uh, you know, that outreach message, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to sort of amplify that through, through the, uh, extension system, as well as integrated pest management program. Um, we have to be focused on the survey and the, uh, and the management side of things here. Um, but certainly those are really important, uh, connections to make in the community. And thanks to, uh, Cornell extension did share a resource on in the chat box for uh, the IPM website as well. So that it looks like that would be helpful for some folks that ask some questions, particularly about um, pesticide use and what could be acceptable. Uh, we have another question that says in your city specifically, any way to know if the spotted lanternfly, excuse me, spotted lanternfly population to be greater or less than last year, uh, given the measures taken to vacuum eggs, the stopping campaign, et cetera. So, you know, one of the real challenges with any of these types of things, whether it's spotted lanternfly or another invasive species, is to have a sense, you know, sense of of true population numbers. Um, and again, you know, the numbers are uh, can be large and really kind of anecdotal to really make a prediction on whether populations will be uh, greater or smaller. Over time, you know, we do know what the reproductive rate is. We do know that if we scrape egg masses, uh, vacuum adults, we do we do reduce the population. Whether that, um, you know, in a year to year, whether you see that as a uh, member of the general public out there, that's that's hard to say. And then the other thing that we don't necessarily understand completely with spotted lanternfly is. What are the what are the things that are um, you know leading that could lead to mortality of spotted lanternfly that are out there naturally in the environment? So there's research projects going on with a couple of naturally occurring bacteria as well as fungi that have been isolated in in areas of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New Jersey where the populations are high, um, and so sometimes they will see some of those those pathogens, if you will, that are that are causing mortality on spotted lanternfly. You also uh, have, a, we have a lot of observations that, that have come in about uh, spotted lanternfly that have been parasitized by another, by some other type of insect. Um, and again, those are, those are things that we, you know, have the research community looking into, because those are potentially things that if we, if we are able to augment them, they may, uh, they probably won't eliminate spotted lanternfly, but in the future, those types of things might reduce the population a bit and, uh, you know, lead to uh, a better level of management. I have another question. It's uh, looking, it's from Emily Russell, and I believe she's from uh, NPR up, up in the North Country. And it says, looking at the county maps, it looks like spotted lanternfly hasn't been reported in the North Country. Uh, is that right? And how would you characterize how much threat the SLF poses to New York compared to other invasives? So, two part question. Okay, so a couple uh, good good question there. So, um, we have not had any reports of spotted lanternfly up in the North Country. Uh, one of the one of the research questions that that is out there uh, to be answered or confirmed is that we do we do have some uh, modeling data that indicates that maybe there are certain parts of New York State where the winter is going to be a, a little bit too severe or the growing season a little bit short uh, for 
a uh, spotted lanternfly to get to the point where they're laying eggs. And so in some of those places uh, that are particularly colder or a shorter season, uh, you might see an introduction of spotted lanternfly, but not see establishment. And the reality is, is we, we, won't, we won't probably know whether those models are correct until we start to see, uh, see an introduction in, in some of those parts of New York. Um, the second part of the question, can you repeat that for me, uh, Yola? Absolutely. It was, how would you characterize how much of a threat SLF is compared, excuse me, poses to New York compared to other invasives? Oh, okay, great. So, um, from the standpoint of, of risk, um, you know, we're very concerned, as I've said a couple times, about the, about the grape industry. Um, I think one of the real challenges with spotted lanternfly is, is that it is, you know, when it's present in large numbers and you have the, and you have the honeydew uh, issue with the, uh, with the sooty mold, that makes it very, very visible to the, to the public. Um, it does not, you know, it does not pose any sort of a health risk. It doesn't sting. It doesn't bite people or animals. So from that perspective, we don't have uh as deep a concern um i guess what i would say is is there are perhaps other invasive species that that we would be potentially more concerned about if we were to see them here in new york state but nonetheless uh you know spotted lanternfly definitely uh can have an impact on grapes as i've said and can have an impact on on quality of life and recreation uh, also, in particular, for, for somebody like yourself in the North Country, um, you rely a lot on tourism. Um, and I think, you know, potentially spotted lanternfly can have an impact, you know, there as well. That's, you know, in addition to the concerns on, on you know, damage to grapes, there's also the tourism aspect of, of the vineyard and the, and the grape industry that, that is a concern as well. Does anyone have any other questions? Again, you can chat us or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. We'll give it a few more minutes to see if anything else pops up. Okay. Well, I think uh, that probably wraps it up. I'm not really seeing anything else pop in and, and not hearing anyone else have any other questions, but I do wanna just go ahead and remind folks that uh, again, we are recording this. So if you are uh, interested in, in hearing this again, or you know having this for a newscast or whatnot, feel free to reach out to us or again, check our YouTube page uh, for that, which will be posted shortly. Otherwise, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us and helping us um, spread the message. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.